Hello, and welcome to this presentation of highlights from the Ukrainian History and Education Center's exhibition From Cultural Identity to Statehood, Ukraine, 1917 to 1921. The UHEC presented this exhibition in 2018 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Ukrainska Narodna Respublika, or Ukrainian People's Republic, which was the first manifestation of Ukrainian independence in the 20th century. The exhibition focused on the role that education, scholarship, culture, religion, and the arts played in the construction of Ukrainian statehood. When the Russian Empire exploded in revolution in 1917, the Ukrainian Central Rada, or Council, led by historian Mikhail Khrushchevsky, at first declared autonomy and then complete independence from the Russian Empire. With independence, the Central Rada was suddenly faced with the need to create all of the symbols of state sovereignty, like a coat of arms, postage stamps, and paper currency, almost from scratch. The seals or coats of arms that had been associated with Ukraine, that would have been familiar to Ukrainians in 1917, had some issues. They either had very strong regional associations, and so would have been inappropriate for a unified Ukrainian nation, or they carried historical baggage that the Rada didn't necessarily want to have associated with their new state. Their solution to this problem was utterly brilliant. They just repurposed an obscure symbol from Ukraine's medieval past. That symbol was the Trizup, or trident. Of course, today, this symbol is instantly recognizable by any Ukrainian or anybody with any decent knowledge about Ukraine. But in 1917, it would have been completely unfamiliar, except to a fairly select group of medievalists or similar historical scholars. The Trezub originally appeared on coins and seals from the 10th and 11th century Kiev and Rus, but it had pretty much vanished from use by the 13th century. 700 years later, the original meaning of the Trezub had become completely lost, and it remains so today. Explanations of the origin of the Trezub have ranged over the years from the reasonably plausible to the utterly ridiculous. One interpretation that I happen to be personally fond of is that it was meant to be a stylized representation of a jur falcon flying downwards in a steep dive with its head at the bottom and its wings splayed out to the sides. But it was exactly this obscurity and ambiguity that made it so useful for the Ukrainian nation builders. It was basically a semiotic blank slate that could be used to carry whatever meanings happened to be convenient. The Rada officially adopted the Trezub as the state seal of the Ukrainian People's Republic in early 1918. It was immediately put to use as an overprint on postage stamps of the Russian provisional government, and it also showed up on the very first Ukrainian banknotes designed by Georgi Narbut. Georgi Narbut was probably the most important and influential Ukrainian graphic designer and illustrator of the early 20th century. Born near the historic town of Hluchiv in northeast Ukraine to a family with connections to Slavic nobility, he studied art in St. Petersburg and then in Munich, and then returned to St. Petersburg, where he was active in the art movement known as Mir Iskustva. In 1917, he moved to Kyiv, where he became a founding member and the rector of the Ukrainian Academy of Arts. Narput had a huge impact on the development of the visual vocabulary of Ukrainian nationhood. Through his designs on postage stamps and banknotes, as well as his other design and illustration work. In April 1918, a German-engineered coup removed the socialist Central Rada from power and installed the conservative monarchist Pavlo Skoropadsky as hetman, or head of state. The impact of this change of government on the visual language of banknotes could not have been more obvious. Narbut's hard-working peasants disappear and are replaced by jewel-bedecked aristocratic ladies in opulent gowns. The Hetmanate did, however, manage to establish an effective administrative structure in the country. 
but its elitist policies created unrest and even led to the beginnings of a peasant insurgency. By August 1918, it was clear that Germany was heading for military defeat, so Skoropatsky attempted to shore up power by allying himself with Russian monarchists. But that only further alienated his Ukrainian base. Under pressure, Skoropatsky abdicated on December 14, 1918, leaving power in the hands of the left-leaning directorate. It is precisely these events that led to the creation of this extraordinary document that was the centerpiece of the UHEC's 2018 exhibition. It is a greeting from the Ministry of Education, Arts, and National Culture to Simon Petlura, the head of the incoming directorate, and it's dated three days after Skoropadsky's abdication. It was hand-lettered by none other than Georgi Narbut, and it has the signatures of 169 employees of the ministry. These were people who had dedicated themselves to building Ukrainian statehood by educating its population, promoting its arts, and preserving its history. Unfortunately, we will probably never know the stories of all of these men and women. Most of them were ordinary rank-and-file workers, and the details of their lives have been lost in the fog of time. However, we can tell the stories of some of the more well-known individuals whose signatures we've actually been able to identify. At the very top, of course, is the signature of Petro Holodny, the Minister of Education. While still a high school student, Holodny had attended evening classes at the famous Murashko Art School in Kiev. He went on to study mathematics, physics, and mineralogy at the Kiev University, and then was teacher of physics and chemistry at the Kiev Technical School. In his spare time, he painted fairy tale scenes and portraits of children in styles that ranged from Impressionist to Neo-Byzantine. He was appointed to the Ukrainian People's Republic Ministry of Education and served as its leader from February 1918 to January 1919. He made his way to Poland after the war, where he began to pursue a serious career as an artist. In addition to easel painting, he was an iconographer, church decorator, and a designer of stained glass windows and kilims. Sofia Lindfors was born in the Chernihiv region of Ukraine to a Swedish father and a French mother. Orphaned as a teenager, she would go on to have an extraordinarily interesting and influential life. Along with her sister, she established the first kindergarten in the city of Kiev. Along with her husband, Oleksandr Rusov, she was an activist for Ukrainian rights within the Russian Empire, and she played a key role in the publication of the first uncensored edition of Taras Shevchenko's poetry. Within the Ministry of Education, she was the head of the Department of Preschool Education. She wrote extensively on early childhood education, and her thinking was influenced by her near-contemporary Maria Montessori. In later life, she would be active in several international women's rights and suffrage organizations. Mikola Bilashivsky was an archaeologist who worked on sites dating from the Neolithic to the Middle Ages. He was a co-founder or member of numerous societies or governmental bodies related to historical and, and antiquities preservation. He was the author of the first law approved by the Ukrainian Republic on the protection of historical monuments, culture, and art. And he was a co-founder of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. Fedir Ernst was born in Kiev to a family of German colonists, and his German background caused him to be arrested and exiled to Siberia at the start of World War I. He returned to Kiev in 1917 and worked under Bilashivsky in the Historical Preservation Commissions of 1917 and 18. He held various positions in the Ministry of Education while also writing two groundbreaking scholarly books on Ukrainian art and architectural history. Under Soviet rule, Ernst continued his scholarship and monuments preservation work. He was arrested during the Stalin terror and charged with counter-revolutionary activity, but was released after serving a three-year term of so-called corrective labor. 
1941, he was arrested yet again, this time on charges of being a German spy. But this time he didn't survive. He was executed by firing squad the following year. Vasily Yemets began to study the traditional Ukrainian stringed instrument called the bandura in 1908 under the Kobzar, or traditional epic singer, Ivan Kuchugur Kucherenko. In early 1918, he served in the Ukrainian military and was part of the forces that were defending Kyiv. Later in 1918, he organized an ensemble of eight Bandurists called the Kobzar Choir, which became the basis of the Kyiv Bandurist Capella. Yemets left Ukraine in 1920. He would go on to perform in concert tours, teach, and organize Bandura ensembles all over Europe and North America, before finally settling down in Hollywood, California. The independent Ukrainian state was well served by the vast talents and skills of those working in the fields of education, history, art, and culture. But they just couldn't withstand the force of arms. Unfortunately, military and diplomatic successes were pretty hard to come by in the geopolitical landscape of 1920 and 21. Nonetheless, the work and the ideas of these pioneers lives on as an inspiration for today's independent Ukraine. Thank you for watching this virtual revival of the Ukrainian History and Education Center's 2018 exhibition From Cultural Identity to Statehood, Ukraine, 1917 to 1921. Although the original exhibition covered more ground than what we were able to present here, we hope that these highlights have introduced you to some of the perhaps less well-known stories of Ukraine 100 years ago.